What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hello and welcome to Chapter 8, The Unification of China, for Mr. Toyama's AP World History. Here's our chapter overview. This chapter explores the unification and expansion of China during the Qin and Han dynasties, 221 BCE to 220 CE, a rich tradition of the social and political philosophies of Confucians, Taoists, and Legalists was the foundation on which these and later dynasties rested. Significant elements contributing to the unification of China in this period included the following. Number one, the building of a centralized bureaucracy staffed with professionals educating Confucian thought and values. Number two, a prosperous economy based on technological and industrial development and long-distance trade. And finally, number three, the standardization of written language. All right, so first up during this time, China has really not settled on a principled idea of what it should be following as a way their society should be organized. And along comes uh, Confucius, uh, traditionally known as Kong Fuzi. Uh, he was born in 551 and lived till about 479 BCE. He was known as Master Philosopher Kong. He had aristocratic roots, meaning he uh, came from a, a noble family or a, a landed family. He was unwilling to compromise principle. Now what that means is that for Kong Fuzi or Confucius, that the principle of something should not be given up in terms of the realistic situation that was happening. So, uh, for example, in your life, a principled stance would be something that uh, you would not break based on the circumstances that were happening that might benefit you. So, for example, if you see a $100 bill sitting on your teacher's desk, and you are, for example, very moral in your heart, and you believe that stealing is absolutely wrong no matter what. You may, for example, uh, be in the classroom with the teacher. The teacher may say, oh, I'm going to step out for a little bit. Nobody do anything. i got to grab something really quick and come back. Now, you as a moral, uh, principled person would not go over and steal $100, put it in your pocket, and walk away because you believe that the principle of not stealing is far more important than the immediate or realistic gain of getting $100 in your pocket. Now, Kung Fuzi was very focused on giving people principles to live by that could be applied to their whole life that would not change based on the circumstances of what was happening. Uh, after a decade of unemployment and wandering, Confuci eventually returned home, a failure, and died soon de thereafter. His teachings become known as the Analects. They uh, consist of a couple different things uh, that we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, but uh, he has a very profound impact on China even to modern day. Uh, here, I've put up a little bit.ly link showing uh, the School of Life videos. There's about three of them in this lecture that I'd like you to pause. You can actually click on the video right here, and it will take you to that video. I'd watch that to give you a better understanding of Confucius, not from my words, but from words of somebody who studied Confucius a lot more in depth than I have, and you get a chance to kind of see it from a very quick five-minute video perspective. So I'll let you kind of click on that. I'll pause here for a second, and then we'll move on. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on. The Confucian ideas, as talked about in the video, uh, number one talks about ethics and politics. It avoided religion and metaphysics. Ethics now are about how one should act in a moral way. This is uh, regar uh, regardless of the situational problems or regardless of if there is gods or a god watching you do anything. Ethics are moral actions that are positive or negative, and you need to choose as an ethical person the good actions over the bad actions. Politics, on the other hand, is defined on how uh, people should govern, what are the best ways to govern, what are the best choices in governing, and how should one go about ruling their peoples. Like I said, they avoided religion, metaphysics, the, the way the world is ordered, maybe in spirits or maybe in the way that the gods in the heavens might see you do actions. It, it avoided this in a lot of areas. Uh, what Confucius did propagate was um, the Junzi, or superior individuals. He believed that by applying properly the ethics of right action and the politics of good action, you will get superior individuals, and they would find their roles in society through government service. So 
by having people who train and study and prepare themselves with the right ethics, train and prepare themselves with the right politics or how to govern, they would become Junzi and they would be able to lead the people because they would have good ideas or good policies that would be embedded in them and they would become good leaders for the people as a whole. They wouldn't steal, for example, from the people because it was advantageous to them. They would do the right thing because that was the ethical thing to do. Uh, there's an emphasis on Zhu te dynasty texts, which later form the core texts of Chinese education. Uh, this is going to be kind of the 101 or the introductory course in Chinese education, understanding who Confucius was, his ideas become the cornerstone of what it means to be Chinese in uh, later education. Some of the Confucian values here are a couple. We have Ren, which is kindness and benevolence. Uh, Confucius believed that a good leader or a good person would be someone who practiced Ren, who practiced kindness and benevolence towards others, someone who didn't seek vengeance, someone who didn't seek to get revenge on others, but instead focused on doing the right things in a kind way. And benevolence means to give freely of yourself and be a good person in terms of sharing uh, your goods, sharing your wealth, sharing the things that you have. He also believed in Li, which is propriety, which means sticking to the way things are. So propriety has to do with, since the government's in charge, they're in charge for a reason, you shouldn't try and overthrow it. Uh, since your family, your elders are in charge of you and they, they've been around longer and they know kind of the way the world works a little more, they should be respected and honored because of their contributions to your life and that there's an order to the world, that the king is in charge and the regents under him are in charge of you and then it goes down all the way to you and you're supposed to follow the order. You shouldn't try and get rid of people. You should just kind of keep things the way they are because that's the way it's ordained and that's how society has been set up and structured and that's good. I also believe in Zhao, which is filial piety. Uh, filial piety is honor and loyalty towards your family and the uh, idea of Li connects back to filial piety in that the male elder, the oldest one, is the head of the family. So, for example, probably a grandfather would be the most important member of the family, and you should listen to him and honor him and help him whenever you can. Next would be the second oldest male in the family, probably your father or your uncle or somebody, and they should be honored and respected for their role as the second oldest person, and so on and so forth until we get down to you. And if there are people younger than you, they're supposed to respect you and honor you and trust you in that you are supposed to practice ren or kindness towards them and they will uh, receive from you benevolence and, and good things and you will help them out. And everyone kind of follows this uh, train of logic and everyone should help everyone below them and respect everyone above them and that will lead to an ordered society. These traits lead to the development of Junzi, which will be good uh, superior leaders that eventually should be the ideal leaders for the society. And these Confucian values will make the society go well because as long as everyone's doing the right things, <clears throat> as long as people are following what they need to be following and doing what they need to be doing, the society should grow and prosper as a result. Next we get what's called Menkes. He was a principal Confucian scholar. He had a very uh, specific idea of how people were organized. He believed that uh, he was an optimist. He believed in the power of Ren, that kindness and benevolence were good things. He was not influential during his lifetime. He's considered a prime exponent of Confucian thought since the 10th century. Uh, as an optimist, he believed that people were good and they were um, designed to practice Ren as much as possible and that Ren should be the natural order of the world, that goodness and kindness are, are positive things and most people want to do the right thing, be kind, be benevolent towards one another, and by doing that, uh, they're going to help themselves. So by being mean to everybody you meet, it's probably not going to work out well for you. So he believed that being an optimist, as promoting these ideas of goodness and kindness, that people will naturally just want to do those things because it, it's in their best interest as well as making the society as a whole better. Then we get to Junzi. He had a career as a government ed, uh, administrator. Uh, he had a, almost an exact opposite of Minkus, and he had a belief in fundamental selfishness of humanity. He believed that uh, people naturally were selfish, and that by being naturally selfish, they're not going to practice Ren. They're not going to do good things. They're not going to want to be kind to one another. And instead, Minkus believed that people were going to take advantage of one another as much as possible without certain structures in place to prevent that. So Junzi was 
emphasizing Lee or rigid propriety. He believed that the only way to keep people from taking advantage of one another and just overusing their power was to keep rigid propriety. Uh, what's to stop someone who believes that uh, they are getting a raw deal to just overthrow society or to overthrow the person above them and get rid of them or kill them? So you have to have rigid propriety, meaning that you believe that the way the system is structured, you have to have reverence or respect for the system itself. You can't just uh, rely on the kindness of people. So even if your your father or your grandpa or the government or whoever's in charge of you is being rude or mean or actually harmful to you, you still have to practice rigid propriety because maybe you just don't understand what they're doing or maybe uh, you need to kind of just follow the rules as is and know your place because that's an important fact of life. You just need to know where you fit into the structure of society. And his big emphasis was on discipline, uh, knowing that... Uh, the order of the way things are are just the way they are and you need to adhere to that and you need to discipline yourself to do your job well and to do uh, your honor and respect to who needs honor and respect and going down the chain you should practice the goodness and kindness if you can but mostly uh, people need to be good anyways because that's just the way society is structured and they shouldn't fight back or rebel because that's just the discipline of following the rules and that the discipline also means that it needs to be structured in a way that uh, when somebody steps out of line people are harshly put back into place meaning that if there was a rebellion you squash it if somebody doesn't want to do their job then you jail them or even possibly kill them you just keep them in line because once you start letting some people kind of go off the rails of doing their own thing that's going to cause societal breakdown and that would be bad next up we have Taoism. now Taoism is kind of opposed to confucianism in a couple different ways number one confucianism believes that if you just apply the right ethics and the right politics to any situation and you follow it uh systematically and do it exactly to the way that your principles are stated then you will get the achieved outcome of good uh, if you believe, for example, in Ren, which is kindness, that eventually good things will happen because you're constantly about kindness. So yes, it might help you now to be unkind, but in reality, you should stick to your principles and be kind no matter what because that's what the way the world should be. Now, these critics of Confucianism under Taoism believe in passivism, meaning not really actively seeking out changes, not really seeking out to change the structure of their society, but just kind of letting it flow. Uh, kind of a symbol of what Taoism kind of represents is kind of going with the flow or, or allowing the way of nature to just take its course and do what it's going to do anyways. There's a rejection of active attempts to change the course of events. So, for example, you might see that bad things are going to happen. Well, bad things are going to happen, so why act? You might see good things are going to happen, so let good things happen. Why act? The idea is to just kind of let the things of this world happen, and you kind of find your place in the letting go and the passiveness of not actively engaging in their change. The founder was known as Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu. He lived in the 6th century BCE, and he wrote a famous text called the Tao Te Ching, or the Tao Te Ching. Uh, it's a classic of the way and virtue. Uh, in the Tao Te Ching, there's a couple different things. It, uh, pro it promotes the idea of the Tao, or the way of being, and uh, it gives a couple examples in the Tao Te Ching. Like, for example, uh, when you think about a wheel, and in a classic wheel, there's a cart wheel, which has spokes on it to support the structure of the wheel. Now, the wheel itself is moving along, and what is there is good, but without the gaps in between the spokes that create absence, the wheel isn't a wheel. It also talks about, um, for example, a house, and without uh, windows and doors, it's just a square box, and it, it's just a square and a cube. If there's no absence inside for people to live, there's no door, which is the absence of wall, and there's no window, which is an absence of a smaller part of the wall, then it's not a house. It's just a cube, and so you need to embrace the absenceness or the missingness of uh, the house to be a house. And then finally, it talks about like a pot and how if you had a clay pot, uh, the point of a pot is to hold something inside of it, either rice or water or some other good. And without the cavity inside of the pot, it's not a pot. It's just a piece of clay. And so it's an embracement of what is not there as well 
as embracing what is there and trying to just kind of see things for the way they are and allowing them to do their thing rather than actively trying to change or manipulate and add to something because there's kind of a beauty and a, uh, a structure to what is not there as well as what is there. And then we get something like the Zhuangzi, which is named for the author. It has a couple different stories in it. One of them talks about the um, author, Master Zhuao, who is sleeping one night, and he has this dream that he's a butterfly. And he's flying around as a butterfly, and he's having this dream, and he's really, really into the dream, and he believes that he is a butterfly. And then suddenly he wakes up, and he's almost a little freaked out because he doesn't understand where the dream ends and where he begins, and he's wondering to himself, am I uh, Master Zhuao that is dreaming that he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming that I'm Master Zhuao? And it it doesn't really matter at the end of the story because you can't really change either one. And so the Taoism kind of pushes its way through because it, there's no active pursuit of trying to figure out that answer because it really doesn't matter. Either you're one, the butterfly, or you're the other, Master Zhuao. So Taoism promotes these ideas of, of emptiness, space, uh, passivity, not actively changing things, and this is completely opposed to the ideas of Confucius that is trying to implement ideals actively on a society to change the course of events. Here again, we have another bit.ly uh, with AP World under Taoism. Go ahead and watch this little short video. I'll put a link right on top of it. You can just click through, spend a couple minutes, watch that, and then come on back. Alrighty, welcome back. So we're going to continue on from here. Now we talked about in the video the Tao or the way of nature, of the cosmos, the way the world is. Uh, it focuses on a couple different like examples. We talked about a couple before the cavity of pots, wheel hubs. They're empty spaces but essential to the thing being that thing. And one I didn't talk about was water. Now water, in the way it is, is not hard. Um, it's not something that's immovable. It kind of goes with the flow, like goes with the river. It just kind of runs over rocks. It goes with gravity. It doesn't really try and actively stop itself from going down a hill. It just rolls down the hill. And it's soft and yielding, and if you kind of build barriers around rivers, it will kind of move itself around the river, and it just kind of goes with the flow. But it's capable of eroding rock, and these the uh, Taoists believe that water is a perfect example of the Tao, that while you should be like water, you should be soft, you should be yielding, but over time your way will kind of work its way through and your will by not resisting will naturally just kind of find its balance, find its equilibrium, and you will kind of go where you need to be. And you will find the way, the Tao of nature, because you have chosen to just go with wherever life takes you. It's kind of a nice thought, I think, sometimes. Then we get to the doctrine of Wu Wei. It's an attempt to control the universe, uh, resulting in chaos. The more it's kind of closely connected with the Tao in that uh, the more we attempt to change and, and manipulate things, the more it results in chaos. Uh, there's a lot of times in our lives where when we try and actively do things, it's only causing more problems. And the, to restore order to our world and to your life and to society, you have to disengage. You don't really want to advance yourself in education because that's just you trying to impose more order on your life, trying to get more degrees and skills. That's not going to help you in the doctrine of Wu Wei. And you're not supposed to have ambition in the doctrine of Wu Wei because ambition means that you have a set of goals that like, you can be disappointed from if you don't get to achieve them. Let's say you want to be a doctor, but uh, you deeply, deeply want to be a doctor, but you don't get there. That's only going to lead to disappointment. So you need to have disengagement, and, and your life will be less chaotic, uh, the world will be less chaotic, and the order to your life will be restored because you're not trying to change things that maybe aren't going to happen anyways. They believe, believed uh, the followers of Wu Wei in simple living in harmony with nature. They believe that uh, letting nature kind of do its thing. You don't really try and destroy whole hillsides to build your house. You just kind of live in the forest. You uh, try and find harmony with nature by not like actively uh, seeking out to dis to create. You're just kind of allowing the world to be and you're a part of it and you're just one with everything in the process of moving forward as a world and you're just one piece in it. They also believed in cultivating self-knowledge, understanding yourself, knowing who you are, looking deeply within yourself and kind of finding uh, 
yourself through meditation, understanding of yourself, and uh, that you cultivate this self-knowledge, which will lead to a better understanding of yourself and able to just like let yourself go with the flow and knowing yourself better. Again, here's our final link. Uh, this is on Wu Wei. You can click on the link right here, and I'll let you go ahead and watch that and come on back. Alrighty, welcome back. We're going to continue on from here. Political implications of Taoism. Confucianism is taught as a public doctrine and Taoism as a private pursuit. Now, a public doctrine of Confucianism is the idea that society should be ordered. And many people reject the idea that Taoism uh, should be used to organize society because it, it kind of leads to anarchy. If everybody just kind of going with the flow, there's no leaders. There's nobody to tell anyone what to do. There's no structure. If we're getting attacked by invaders... You kind of just, in Taoism, let it go with the flow. Maybe you all die. That's okay. And that many people are not okay with that. So Confucianism is taught as a public doctrine to be able to say, okay, here's what needs to happen. We need those Junzi, those strong, superior individuals to lead us. We need to follow the ideas of Ren and Li and a couple different other ideas in Confucianism to keep everybody in order. The oldest should be in charge. The youngest should listen. Uh, society needs to be ordered along certain lines. And that's a good thing. And that's why the public doctrine becomes Confucianism. Taoism, however, is seen as a private pursuit, not really like a religion, but the way that people want to live their lives is to kind of go with the flow, stand stand back a little bit and look at what's going on and kind of find their path through that without really causing too much of a, of a fight or pushback. And it's an ironic combination allowed intellectuals to pursue both. Uh, you can see how these, these diametrically opposed ideas are really having an intellectual struggle within an individual. Because if you believe that Confucianism is a good way to order society, but you also believe that Taoism is a good way for you to live, people basically make up the society. So how should government be organized if Confucianism is public, but Taoism is how people act? So it kind of causes this uh, intellectual discussion and people try and find ways to kind of blend them together. And these intellectuals talk about it uh, endlessly during this time. Then comes the idea of legalism. It's an emphasis on the development of state. Ruthless ends justify the means. And so here's how it works. The emphasis on the development of state means that the state should be the primary. It's a similar idea to Confucianism that the, the order of society should be the state or the society or the government as a whole, and then goes down to family and then individuals. But the development of the state needs to happen because uh, it's the best way to promote the most good to the most people. Now, if the development of the state means that we need a lot of soldiers to go out and hurt people so that we can be safe, then that's what we have to do. It, we can say all we want about Taoism, we can say all we want about Confucianism, but at the end of the day, we need to have big bad men with spears or guns or whatever to go out and hurt people that want to hurt us. And so it's ruthless in that if you don't want to go, too bad, you got to go to fight people. If you don't want to grow crops, too bad, we got to grow crops or people are going to die. And if you don't want to fight or if you don't want to be a part of that system, well, then maybe eventually we're going to have to kill you and get rid of you or throw you in jail. And so these ends justify the means. Yes, people are going to be unhappy with your policies. Yes, people are going to be unhappy with the way things go, like taxes, for example. But you don't want to live in a society without taxes, without an army, without a structure where it's just pure chaos. The role of, all, of law is paramount. It's at the very top of this legalism view of the world. There is strict punishment for violators. There's In our society, we believe that there are times where somebody may do something that's wrong, but in reality, the ethical thing is kind of letting them do that wrong thing. For example, a famous story is a man has a very sick wife or a sick child, and there's a window at a pharmacy with the medicine that can save the life of their wife or child, and the man doesn't have any money and it's closed. Well, the man decides to take a brick, break the window, steal the medicine, save his wife, save his child, whichever one it is in your example. And we would all say, oh, yeah, of course. Like, what is one window and maybe some money to the life of one human being? But in legalism, they would say the role of law is you don't break things, you don't steal things that aren't yours, and there should be strict punishment. It doesn't matter your reasons for doing it. There is a specifically laid out law, and you can't break it, and if you break it, too bad. You're getting the punishment, just like as if you 
were trying to do it for malicious reasons. There's a principle of collective responsibility that we are all in this together, that together we need to organize society and we all need to pull in the same direction. And if you don't want to pull in the same direction of supporting the state, supporting the government, supporting what we're doing as a, as a society, then you need to be removed from the society through jailing, through punishment, through possibly even death. Shang Yang, the book of Lord Shang, uh, outlines a lot of organizational principles that uh, kind of set up the state and the idea that the government is in charge, the people underneath that, and it, it's actually a dedication to the state, even above family and evil, even familial piety. And that if your family tells you to do one thing, but the government tells you to do another, you're supposed to listen to the government, according to the Shang Yang. And uh, this is a very big shift from Confucianism because they would believe that filial piety is a cornerstone and that uh, because the government is supposed to be good or acting with ren or kindness or benevolence, then it wouldn't ask you to do anything that would go against your filial piety. But in legalism, they understand that probably there are going to be times where your family doesn't like something, but you need to follow the government because it's best for all of society. Maybe it's not good for you individually, but we all together have to do the right things to make the world or our society better. And then we get to Han Fitzi. He was forced to commit suicide by his political enemies. Han Fitzi uh, is big on, uh, again, the idea that the government is supreme, that the government needs to be supported by the people, and it's not a, a good thing to rebel or fight back, and that punishment should be swift, it should be the applied evenly to everybody, no matter the crimes, and uh, eventually he's forced to commit suicide by his political enemies because he's seen as very radical for the time. The legalist doctrine focuses on a couple things, two strengths of the state, the agriculture and the military. We've talked about this in the past. Agriculture is huge and important to society because if you don't have any food, you don't have any people, and you don't have any society. People are going to go with their base instincts, member Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, safety, shelter, uh, and without food, that's going to kind of not make a society run really well. So we have to protect the agriculture and make sure that people are getting fed and society is happy and fed. And then we have to protect the people through the military. If there are bad guys that want to hurt us, we need to have big bad dudes of our own to go out and hurt them so that we don't get hurt ourselves. There's the emphasis, um, the development of peasant soldier classes, that the peasant's job is to grow food. That's their job, and we need to emphasize that and develop that and cultivate the people and understanding their place and teaching them and training them in that way. And then we also need to have soldier classes, people who go out, stab people, hurt people that want to hurt us, and we need to have them as a well-trained and organized group. And without those two groups, we don't have a society that is able to do anything else. We can't get to religion. We can't get to happiness. We can't get to ethics. We can't get to art, architecture, literature, any of that stuff. We have to focus on the first two things, which is safety and food. There is a distrust in legalist doctrine on pure intellectual cultural pursuits because they see them as frivolous. Uh, when you're hungry, you're not really in the mood to talk about deep ideas and intellectual, cultural art and stuff. If you're getting stabbed by bad invaders, you really don't care about the ethical quandaries of, say, am I a butterfly having a dream or am I a dream having a butterfly, whatever that is. You just really are not looking at the world in a realistic way. And the legalists are big on realism, that the way to do the right thing is pretty much doing whatever needs to be done to keep the most people safe and maybe not happy, but at least alive, that's the way that it should be um, structured. Historically, it's been often imitated but rarely praised. Legalism doesn't always work out because we understand the world's big, it's complicated. Do we really want to make laws and rules that are in so inflexible that they are applied evenly to every person? In the example I gave before about the breaking of the window to get the medicine, is there anyone amongst us, I think, that really believes a hundred percent of the time that that is a wrong way to live uh, or to, to treat the person who breaks the window. There maybe are a few, but it, overwhelmingly there is a majority of us who believe that there are instances where um, certain things need to change based on the circumstances and that's why we have different laws and that's why we have judges who are able to apply laws differently based on the circumstances that are surrounding it. That's why, for example, if um, I'm mad at you 
and I see you in the street and I run you over with my car and I get out and say, yep, I ran you over with my car because I hate you and I don't like you, I should go to jail. But if, for example, um, I'm in the car and you're riding your skateboard and I accidentally run you over because I was looking at the light and I wasn't really paying attention to the crosswalk, uh, if I accidentally kill you, the law in America, for example, has certain... Uh, mechanisms in place that I won't go to jail forever, that I might even have suspended sentence of probation, I might not be able to drive again, but I won't be put to death, for example, for intentionally trying to kill somebody. And that's almost the opposite of legalism. In legalism, both instances, I would be uh, given the same punishment no matter what. Next, we get to the unification of China. The Qin Dynasty develops, 4th to 3rd century BCE. They give generous land grants under Shang Yang. Private farmers decrease power of large landholders. These land grants are basically chunks of land given out under Shang Yang to private farmers who now have the land and ability to cultivate their own food for themselves and even take some of that food to the market to trade. These large land owners that had the land before lose power because they're no longer allowed to... Uh, basically create tenant farmers, which are people who are attached to the land and have to grow food and pay taxes to feed themselves and feed uh, the lord of the land. And the large landowners also have less money as a result of smaller land holdings. There's an increasing centralization of power under uh, Shang Yang, and there's improved military technology, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. The first emperor was Qin Shuang Jidi. He ruled from 221 to 210 BCE, founds a new dynasty as the first emperor. The dynasty ends in 207, but sets a dramatic, dramatic precedent. The basis of rule is centralized bureaucracy. And I've talked about this before. It's one of my favorite B words, bureaucracy, that uh, having a society organized around one person making all the decisions doesn't always work out super well because the one person isn't always... Uh, able to see the the on the ground kind of effects of their policies, they're not able to kind of apply situational awareness to different ideas and s situations. And so, having a centralized bureaucracy helps in being able to say, okay, here's the rule or here's the idea, and let's make a law, and then have other individuals that are assigned uh, with the power of the emperor or a power of the government to go out and enforce those laws. A very famous example is like taxes, for example. Now, the government needs taxes to pay for the military, for public works, for other things that uh, make society run and work out well. And the centralized bureaucracy helps to ensure that the taxes are collected. If the emperor was to go around and try and collect taxes from each and every person, that could take forever, and he'd never actually collect it, and people could hide their money, and there would be lots of problems. But the centralized bureaucracy allowed the uh, emperor to kind of say, okay, here's what I need. I need everyone to go out and collect taxes from all the people. And he would assign uh, tax collectors to go to different regions and different villages and different towns and collect the money from the people. And then each one of them would bring back the money to the center, the big part of the government, and they would then be able to collect it efficiently and faster. And this works out really well because you're not really – uh, having one individual have to exert a lot of power. You have a lot of smaller individuals using a very little amount of power that they've been given through centralized bureaucracy to enforce the laws or the mandates that have been happened that have been created through uh, the emperor. Massive public works begin under uh, Qin Shuangji. Uh, it's a precursor to the Great Wall of China that we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, here in the Qin Empire is in yellow. We see Mongolia in the northwestern region. We see uh, the uh, eastern border of China pretty much set up. We see the walls that have been built that will eventually be integrated into what is known as the Great Wall. They were originally to keep out the steppe peoples from the Mongolian regions. And uh, this... Uh, centralization of power under the Qin dynasty helps to create the what we would know as like the first dynasty of China or the start of China. There's a resistance to Qin policies. The emperor orders execution of all critics. This is a very harsh and brutal way to run a country or a society. Uh, you Executing all your critics doesn't really bode well for uh, making you a very popular person, but it does kind of silence people from criticizing whatever you're doing. Uh, this kind of would be in the legalist tradition of kind of supporting the state no matter what, and it, if you make a law that says anybody who criticizes the emperor, they're going to die, well then, they're going to die. He orders the, under the Qin policies, there's the ordering burning of all ideological works, all works that, um, 
are about philosophy, literature, religion, anything that isn't really in support of the state necessarily is burned. Some 460 scholars are buried alive, they dig big holes, they push them all in, and they throw dirt on them until they're basically suffocating to death. Others were kicked out or exiled from the countries, uh, from China itself, and there's massive cultural losses. At this time, we know that like lots of the um, what we know of writing and intellectual work and philosophy and ethics kind of disappears from history because no one is able to carry on their tradition or their um, ideals. Under the chin, there's centralization. There's a couple standardizations that happen. Number one, there's standardization of laws. Everybody applies. Uh, the law applies equally to everyone, and it's all the same across the entire uh, holdings of the chin. The currencies are standardized, meaning that the money is always the same size, shape, its value is the same no matter where you travel within that space. Uh, weights and measurements are made the same. We talked about this in the past, that like a pound in California is the same weight as a pound in New York. And this weights and measurement systems uh, helps to facilitate trade and commerce because you know that like what you're getting for one pound in one region can be compared evenly to another pound in another region. And finally, script. Previously, there's a single written language with distinct scripts, and now it's one language with one cultural uh alphabet that is always the same across the entire empire and there's the building of roads and bridges that supports trade and commerce there were massive tomb projects built by 700,000 workers slaves concubines and craftsmen sacrificed and buried after it uh, these massive tombs were created, excavated in 1974, 15,000 terracotta sculptures of statue, soldiers, horses, and weapons were unearthed. Uh, I'll show you a little picture here. Uh, this was found in 1974. These terracotta warriors from the tomb of Qin Shuang Hengui, the first emperor, uh, shows that he was trying to promote uh, a sense that even long after he had died, that uh, just like in Egypt, his slaves architectural workers, concubines were killed and buried with him, and that he would have this terracotta soldier army that stood guard around him, showing the power and might of the first Qin Emperor. And uh, this is a feat even to this day. It, you can look online at some of these pictures, the detail. Each one of these soldiers has very small um, differences in their dress, in what they're carrying. You can We can tell what uh, military rank they are based on their positions based on the uh, adornment that they're wearing in these terracotta sculptures we see that there are um they're broken up into regiments or groupings we see horses there's a couple different groupings of weapons and this is just an amazing feat even to this day for such a time as uh people were doing this basically by hand uh through artisanship and craftsmen then we get to the Han disability, the Han Dynasty. The civil disorder brings down the Qin Dynasty. You're not a very popular emperor if you're going around pr promoting a very strict legalism. You're not a very popper, popular emperor if you're killing off a lot of your um, subjects. You're making 700,000 people build you a giant tomb. And eventually civil disorder brings down the Qin Dynasty in 207. Lu Bangs formed the new dynasty known as the Han Dynasty, 206 BCE to 220 CE. The former Han is 206 BC to 9 CE. There's an interruption around 9 to 23 CE, and the later Han is known uh, during the time of 25 to 220 CE. Early Han policies. They relaxed the Qin tyranny without returning to Zhu anarchy. Under the Zhu, there was a lot of just like freedom. There wasn't a centralization. Uh, we talked about this in earlier chapters on China. But the Qin tyranny of strict legalism and strict adherence to certain policies was kind of relaxed. They created large land holding but maintained control over administrative regions. Uh, these large land holdings allowed those former uh, landholders to get back some of their uh, land. Many of them had died by this point, but there is this reemergence of a large land holding class. Uh, there's a maintaining control over administrative regions. When you have lots of land, you have lots of money, you can usually pay for your own armies or you can get people to be devoted to you in the fact that you're feeding them. And this allows. Uh, you to kind of start your own rebellion if you like, but this administrative control under the early Han keeps back uh, rebellions and other uh, large-scale revolts. After a failed rebellion, they took more centralized control. This original attempt to keep the administrative regions in check doesn't really work out very well, and so they have to take a more centralized control in the people's lives. 
under uh, the Martial Emperor Han Udi. He increased taxes to fund more public works. There's a Han centralization. We talked about the Qin centralization. Now there's a Han centralization. Uh, the public good is being promoted through public works. There's a huge demand for government officials, a decline since the Qin persecution. Under the Qin, there wasn't a very big uh, price tag or value attached to intellectuals. Uh, we talked about them being buried alive, their works burned, some of them were exiled. Uh, many of these government officials are needed because you need to have a centralized bureaucratic structure to support your society. But um, without an educated class to do this, like reading, writing, understanding how government works, having just a larger sense of who they are through education, uh, you need to have a large demand for government officials to start doing those sorts of things so you can have a society work well. The Confucian educational system, Han Wudi establishes an imperial university in 124 BCE. He doesn't love scholarships, but demanded an educated class for bureaucracy. We talked about that before. He's not a huge fan of really smart people, because sometimes leaders don't like when the common person can be smarter than him through education. But he understands that there needs to be an educated class to run the bureaucracy and collect taxes. They need to know how to count. They need to know how to create receipts. They need to know how to write. And... They eventually will adopt Confucianism as an official course of study. Why is this important to um, the Han Dynasty? Because you don't want to go back to the times of rebellion. You need to have Confucian ideas of filial piety, of um, propriety, of being able to understand your place and order in society, that a bureaucrat's job is to be a bureaucrat. Their job is to collect taxes, then that's your job. Go collect taxes. Don't start talking about politics. Don't start arguing why taxes are high or why we have to pay them. Just go collect the taxes and make sure things go smoothly that way. 3,000 students by the end of former Han and 30,000 by the end of later Han. So this bureaucratic class grows by 10 uh, during the 200 years or so that we have been talking about. The Han Imperial Expansion, there's invasions into Vietnam and Korea, and there are constant attacks from, okay, Zhongnu, which would be like northwestern China during this time, like parts of Mongolia and the steppe regions. Nomads from Central Asia, they were horsemen, and uh, bru they were very brutal under, for example, Mao Dun, who reigned from 210 to 174 CE. He had his soldiers murder his wife and father because they displeased him in some way. And Han Wu Di briefly dominates Zhuang Nu. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Here is East Asia and Central Asia at the time of Han Wudi, around 87 BCE. In the yellow, you can see the Han Empire. Uh, in the orange, you can see the Zhuangnu Confederation, and there's some overlapping border region. If you remember back to our earlier map, that little overlapping region is where the wall will be built, uh, eventually for the Great Wall to keep out those northern nomadic peoples, such as the Mongols. There's a patriarchal social order. We talked about patriarchy as being... Um, father as the head. There's a classic of filial piety, the subordination to elder males. This is a big Confucian idea is that the way the society is structured is good, and this needs to be set up in filial piety, that the elder males, the oldest male on down to the youngest male, and then the oldest woman on down, you need to, to bend your will to what they want. If your father tells you to go out in the field and dig holes, then you got to go out and do, dig holes because that's your place in life. If you're a male, eventually you will be the old man one day and that will be your job to command the younger people and that will keep society in order. And then we get a Lessons for Women from Ban Zhao. She has a very big contribution to world history because she is one of the first people to talk about in 45 CE that education should be available to all children. Her argument is this, that uh, men are the head of the household and that women are to support their husbands in this process and the only way that women can support their husbands in this process is to make sure that y young daughters and young sons are educated in understanding as males the right way to do things as a head of a household and that women who eventually daughters who eventually become wives can support their husbands by understanding certain precepts about society. They then get to iron metallurgy. There's an expansion of iron manufacture. The iron tips on tools are abandoned as tools are entirely made from iron. Originally, iron was scarce, but then they increase their uh, metallurgical prowess, and they're able to produce whole tools that are able to be more resilient during warfare. They have increased food production uh, because of iron tools that are able to help them to cultivate more land and superior weaponry to those around them uh, 
during this time. There are other te technological developments, the cultivation of silkworms. Silk comes from worms, and they worked on selective breeding processes where they chose the worms that produced the best silk, the most luxurious silk. They, they selectively bred uh, silkworms that were resistant to diseases and were able to uh, produce a lot of silk very efficiently. They also controlled their diet. Other silk producing lands relied on wild worms where they just found worms, kind of just let them produce silk. And as they collected enough silk, they eventually uh, would make some silk. But the uh, Chinese were the first to really control what the silkworms were eating to produce the best and high quality silk. And uh, this creates a very... Uh, high price on Chinese silk coming out of this region during this time. We also get the development of paper as we would know it today. Originally it was bamboo and fabric that was written on and it would be bound together in strips kind of like um, what I like to think of as a very tightly bound uh, window coverings. You know how like you have the blinds in your house and they kind of fit together on top of each other with rope? Uh, what they would do is just write on the little s slots or in between and they would kind of bound them together and then roll them up to protect them. Uh, fabric also, if you just kind of unfurl some fabric, imagine just writing on your bed sheet and then you can roll it up and keep it safe. Well that's abandoned in favor of wood and textile based paper. They also developed the crossbow trigger. A uh, crossbow can fire an arrow more efficiently. You don't have to be a skilled archer. You just kind of aim the bow and like pull a trigger and it lets go of the arrow and it fires it pretty far and efficiently. Uh, you, they also developed the horse collar. It's a thing that goes around a horse's neck that is able to pull a plow more efficiently. Normally, if you're using a rope around a horse, you can make it very sick or you can even damage the horse by using a rope for them to pull a very heavy iron plow behind them. But the horse collar move, shifts the weight from around their throat to onto their shoulders, if horses have shoulders, at least onto their legs, where they can pull the plow more efficiently. And a ship rudder. A ship rudder is the thing that goes into the water that allows the ship to kind of use Use the current to tilt it one way or another as it moves through the water. There are economic and social difficulties. The expenses of military expeditions, especially the, against the Zhuangdu, uh, taxes become increasing, and there's a beginning of arbitrary property confiscations rise. Uh, randomly, the government just kind of goes in and says, all this land from this section to this section is now the government's property and it's going to be redistributed to new peoples. This pisses off a lot of people. And there's an increasing gap between the rich and poor. Uh, slavery kind of grows under this, that you, people have to sell themselves into slavery for uh, paying back debts and tenant farming. Tenant farming is where you have to work on the land, but you owe the landowner a certain portion of your goods. Many times you give them basically what you would make in profit from your labor. So all you're left with is enough to uh, feed your family, and then you'd still be in debt to the landowner, and every year you could never basically leave. You're just stuck to the land because you're always in debt. This brings rise to banditry and rebellion. Banditry is where you go out and you steal stuff or rob people, and rebellion is where you try and overthrow the government. Then we get to the reign of Wang Meng. Wang Meng is the regent or overseer for two-year-old emperor. If in a classic uh, noble lineage type of empire is set up, if the ruler or the king-to-be is too young to take the throne, depending on the society's interpretation of how young is young, the regent is somebody who is a trusted advisor of the king or the king's family. Once he passes on, he is in charge of keeping together the kingdom and making wise decisions for the very young uh, future king. And his job is to be a good advisor and to kind of act as king for a while until the future king is old enough to take the throne and, and kind of do his thing the way he's supposed to do it. Well, Wang Meng is the regent for that two-year-old emperor in 6 CE, and he takes power for himself in 9 CE. And by taking power for himself, he kind of just gets rid of that two-year-old emperor. Well, actually, at this point, he would have been five. And he introduces massive reforms. He's known as the socialist emperor, and we'll talk about socialism a little later, but socialism is the idea of promoting the good, using the power of the government to promote the good of the most, for the most people. And so... Uh, he does this thing of land distribution, but it's poorly handled. He tries to give back a lot of the land to the peasants, but some of the land owners that were uh, holding a lot of land kind of 
start to get upset and then he kind of goes back and it kind of gets confusing and this social chaos ends in his assassination in 23 CE. So this is one of those times where uh, an emperor actively tries to do the good for the people and as a result ends up kind of making a lot of people more angry in the end. In the later Han Dynasty, the Han Dynasty, Han Dynasty emperors manage with difficulty to reassert control. This chaos of land redistribution, not knowing who owns what, how debts are set up, where people are getting paid from, causes what's known as the Yellow Turban Uprising under land distribution problems. People are increasingly felt like, feeling like they are losing lots of money, they're being overtaxed, and they're feeling like the government is increasingly not caring about their welfare and their needs, and so there's a rebellion by these people known as the Yellow turbans and uh the yellow turbans were known basically because of these like yellow scarves they wore on their heads to kind of distinguish themselves as like their own group or gang and there was a lot of internal court intrigue meaning there were scandals and assassination attempts and all kinds of juicy gossipy stuff you can read about in your book uh and there was a weakened han dynasty that collapses by 220 ce here we go, I made it to the end. When you finish this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Compare and contrast the emergence of belief systems designed to restore political and social order in China. We talked about mm, three, four in there, and uh, how did those belief systems try to restore political and social order in China during this time? Explain and discuss the unification of China through the efforts of the Qin Dynasty. How did the Qin Dynasty rise? What did they do to try and unify China? And there were a couple, there was one big slide that talked about its uh, centralization process. Uh, explain the rise and success of the early Han Dynasty. In the early Han Dynasty, how were successes measured and why was it so successful? Next, discuss the reasons behind productivity and prosperity during the former Han era. Uh, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. Next, identify the social and economic difficulties that led to the decline of the former Han Dynasty. What happened in society and economically that caused problems to have the, form, the former Han Dynasty fall apart? And finally, discuss the important features of the later Han Dynasty. Here's your writing assignment. Write a short response, five to eight sentences. The following questions using specific examples from the textbook and be prepared to discuss them in class. Number one, what factors during the Qin and Han worked against political stability and economic prosperity? How did these factors eventually contribute to the collapse of the Han? Okay, so what factors caused the Qin and Han Dynasty to not create political stability and economic growth. And how did these factors eventually contribute to the collapse of the Han? Number two, which aspects of Chinese culture during this period were most influenced by Confucianism, by Taoism, or legalism? Explain your responses. I would just make a bullet point list and just kind of say, okay, Confucianism, Taoism, legalism, and just start writing out some of the things that it were influenced as a result of those three ideas. And then I would explain kind of right after each of those um, specific things of why uh, those ideas were influential to those things that you've chosen. And finally, number three, what did the discovery of the tomb of the first emperor tell us about China during the Qin? Uh, this is kind of one of those things you have to look back in your book for a lot more detailed response than what I went into, but uh, you can get a lot just by looking at the tomb of the first Qin emperor uh, and seeing how he structured his society, what his priorities were, what were some of the things that he was bearing along with him, what were some of the things that were valuable to the Qin society as a whole. As always, it's been nice talking to you. It's time for you to go back, reread your book, uh, go ahead and answer those questions, make sure you have them ready to discuss the so next time I see you. Have a great time reading. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.